And it's now my pleasure to introduce another friend and colleague, Dr. Donald Palmer. Um, Dr. Palmer is a professor at the Graduate School of Management at the University of California, Davis. His research includes examining why otherwise law-abiding, ethical, and socially responsible people participate in wrongful behavior. His conclusions are based on an understanding of basic psychological, social psychological, and sociological processes that shape human behavior. His research on wrongful behavior has centered on three substantive areas, the adjudication of workplace safety violations, the use of banned performance enhancing drugs in professional cycling. Uh, Davis, California is the cycling mecca of the United States and the perpetration of child sexual abuse in youth serving organizations. Um, before I bring him up, I'll just mention that Dr. Palmer gets the award for best publication title with this paper, Drugs, Sweat, and Gears, an organizational analysis of the use of banned performance enhancing substances in advance of the 2010 Tour de France. Drugs, Sweat, and Gears. I would love to be able to write like that. That's great. <laughs> Um, perhaps more relevant to today, Professor Palmer and I met in Australia when we were part uh, when we were invited to serve as expert witnesses to the Royal Australian Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, which uh, Ben just just described. As part of that effort, Professor Palmer and his colleagues have now published articles and have a forthcoming book forthcoming book on the role of organizational culture in child sexual abuse. This work, I believe, will fundamentally shift how we go about preventing child sexual abuse. And I, I really could not be happier than to invite him to the stage. Please join me in welcoming Professor Palmer. Well, first of all, let me uh, thank the Moore Center and the Moores and Dr. Paterno for inviting me to speak. It's an honor to uh, talk with the other speakers who are going to be presenting today in the audience, both in the room and on the web. Um, it's also, uh, thanks for including a picture of me when I had more hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm an organizational sociologist, and as Dr. Letourneau pointed out, I study a range of types of misconduct in organizations, and for the last three or four years, I've been focusing on child sexual abuse in organizations. And What I'd like to do today is share with you um, what I believe is an organizational sociology or organization theory approach to understanding child sexual abuse in organizations. Um, I'm going to try to do that by drawing on details from the sexual abuse scandal in USA Gymnastics, which began with the revelation of this massive abuse of over 100 um, gymnasts and other athletes by Dr. Larry Nasser, but, but is, does not stop there. And then briefly at the end, indicate my uh, what I believe are some policy implications that flow from an organizational approach. Organizational approach is different than the approach taken by other scholars, public health scholars, social work scholars, criminologists, but not incompatible. I think it's fully complementary. Um, broadly speaking, um, organization theorists refer to organizations as strong situations. Unlike the family or the community, there's a range of structures and processes that are in operation there that you don't find to the same extent in another context. For example, there may be a division of labor in your household. Um, if you have a daughter and a, a son, maybe the, the daughter's responsible for walking the dog, and maybe the son is responsible for making sure that there's always fresh milk in the refrigerator. Um, but most organizations, formal organizations, have a much more elaborate division of labor. Um, the organizational approach to child sexual abuse most fundamentally maintains that the, the character of these structures and processes in an organization influence the perpetration, the detection, and the response to abuse when it occurs. Um, today, for reasons of 
time, I'm going to focus on just a couple of these structures and processes. And in fact, I've underlined four, but to keep us roughly speaking on uh, schedule, I'm going to just talk right now about the first three. Um, and I'm going to maybe stay a little bit longer than uh, on the other two on the, on the cultural explanation. Before I begin, though, I need to say that I've talked about um, an organizational approach to misconduct in a number of settings. And it's not uncommon for people to, in hearing me present, think that the organizational approach is making excuses for the organizations and individuals who perpetrate misconduct. And so I want to be very clear right from the start. I'm trying to understand or explain abuse as it occurs in organizations. I'm not trying to make excuses for the organizations and individuals that perpetrate it. Absolutely clear on that. <laughs> um, so to begin, I'll start with what I consider the low-hanging fruit, which is administrative systems. Administrative systems are the things that I think are perhaps the easiest to see in organizations. We're all familiar with the division of labor, separation of activities into separate subunits. A key variable that organization theorists think about is the degree to which subunits are autonomous, that is controlled, is decentralized. And then within units, there are rules and protocols, standard operating procedures, and other things which guide behavior. In the case of the USA Gymnastics, I think administrative structures come into play in a number of respects. I'm going to be very brief. A major factor is just the degree of decentralization within Olympic sports, which is, by the way, a unique character of American organizations. Decentral American organizations are more decentralized than organizations than, say, Germany or China or the former Soviet Union and Russia. Um, so in the case of Olympic sports, the United States Olympic Committee was constituted as a financial and marketing entity. It could charter national governing bodies in the various sports, but it could not enter those organizations and tell them what to do. Um, so when the victim statements at, before the hearing, uh, the sentence hearing for Dr. Larry Nassa made it absolutely clear that the scandal was massive, the USOC had to act. And what they did was they wrote a letter to the USA Gymnastics and said, we'd like you to do these things or we'll revoke your charter. They couldn't make those things happen. They could only ask and threaten. Um, if I had time, we could talk more about how USA Gymnastics was structured, but it was also decentralized, relatively speaking, limited to certifying coaches and organizers of competition. Um, rules were also important. And if you read um, and kept track of the USA Gymnastics scandals, you may have come across articles which talked about a rule which members of USA Gymnastics believed existed, a rule that stated that when people come forward with allegations, unless it's a victim willing to make an official allegation, they should be ignored. And as such, no records should be kept of it. That's administrative policy, which greatly undermined response to abuse in the gymnastics community. Now, you may think, um, well, was there such a rule? And there's actually, in fact, debate about whether that rule existed. But the funny thing is, in organizations, as long as people believe there's a rule, they follow it. So for example, I was told through the communication that I received from the Moore Center that I would have to show my ID in order to enter the building. And so when I got off the shuttle, I pulled out my ID. I was ready to show it. Now, I didn't need to do that, as it turned out. Um, but I believed there was a rule, and I was going to follow it. Um, I could talk some more about administrative structures, but I, I, mindful of the time, I want to move quickly to culture. Because culture is something that a lot of people who write about misconduct in organizations, especially child sexual abuse, mention. But it's often not mentioned in a way which is either penetrating and sometimes 
not correct. Um, so what organizational sociologists mean by culture um, is two things. There's content, those messages which culture sends people that directs them to behave in the ways they do. And then there are forms which telegraph that content. Um, the content is often broken down into three categories. There are assumptions about the way the world works. There are values and beliefs about what's good and bad. And then there are norms, things that tell us what we should or should not do. Again, conveyed to us by these things called forms. Um, artifacts are the smallest units of cultural forms. Practices are behaviors that often combine artifacts. Many of you who have followed the USA Gymnastics scandal will know that the culture is often characterized as focusing on winning, in particular winning medals. But I think if you read closely um, the journalistic accounts of USA Gymnastics, you can pick up on some other content. Olympic sports was viewed as a business. Not surprising, the major reforms in Olympic sports were done at the um, initiative of George Steinbrenner, who was the famous owner of the New York Yankees, um, very famous and successful business person. Further, the assumption was that coaches are central to the success of this business. And then most unfortunate, I think, was the view that gymnasts who were 14 and 15 were just small versions of fully formed human beings. They were small people. They weren't children. And so what that meant was a variety of norms proliferated through the organization. Um, focus of coaches should be on improving the athlete's performance, not developing them fully as children. So you don't need to educate gymnasts about what's appropriate and inappropriate behavior between coaches and children. Children don't need protection because they aren't children. They're fully formed adults. They're just small. Um, again, the reference always being that these are athletes. These are my athletes. They're not my children. Um, intimate relationships were accepted between coaches and young gymnasts. And coaches were frequently believed over the allegations of gymnasts because they were viewed as being central to the organization. Um, as one person said, you can't win championships, that's what the organization's about, if you're constantly busting your best coaches. Um, I probably should say that many of these things that I'm talking about also are operating in the Catholic Church. I think, I'm not Catholic, but my daughter is. Um, Abuse was viewed as a sin, which could be forgiven. It wasn't viewed as a crime that needed to be punished. Um, I think that's a key element of the culture of, of the Catholic Church in this regard of child sexual abuse. By the way, the notion that culture can authorize intimate relationships between adults and children um, brings up something which I think is an important fact that um, has emerged from other research on child sexual abuse in organizations, which is a lot of that abuse is situational. It's perpetrated by people who don't have an abiding, underlying, inherent sexual attraction to children. It happens as a result of the experience of the perpetrator in the organization. Um, again, mindful of time, I could talk some more about culture, but I can't get off the podium without talking about power. Um, a lot has been written about power and the role it plays in child sexual abuse, but I think uh, a, a more thorough mining of organization theory can elaborate further the role of power in child sexual abuse in organizations. Um, there are two kinds of power in organizations. There's formal power, sometimes referred to as formal authority. That's lit, kind of embedded in the chain of command. It's enforced by the norm of obedience to authority. That's something we learn very early on in kindergarten. Um, my daughter learned it really well. My son 
not so well. Uh, so we don't all embrace this norm uh, as thoroughly as uh, the next person. And there are various kinds of bases or legitimacy um, that office holders have um, that allow them to make commands. For most of us, um, the form of authority that we convey in the workplace is referred to as rational legal. It's based on our competence and our control of rewards and punishments. That kind of authority is relatively limited in scope. So Dr. Letourneau, for example, presumably has some subordinates at the Moore Center, and she could ask them, uh, for example, um, probably nicely, um, but firmly, um, I want you to copy edit this brochure, and I want it done by 2 o'clock. Authority which is rooted in religious ideas or charisma, possession of a special characteristic, is particularly problematic because it's very wide in scope. I'm sure Dr. Letourneau has some charisma, but that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a belief in almost um, a kind of ethereally given uh, special characteristics. So she can't tell her subordinates to eat a light breakfast or to go to bed at 8 o'clock or not to associate with this person and hang out with this other person. But those who have authority rooted in charisma and religion can. The other kind of power is informal power. This is power which is rooted in the control of scarce and valued resources. Both kinds of power were really consequential in the case of the USA Gymnastics child sexual abuse scandal. There were numbers of people at USA Gymnastics that simply followed the directives of their superiors. In one case, there was someone who was responsible for handling allegations of misconduct, who was on several occasions simply instructed, you should ignore that allegation. The person in question was a former FBI agent, much more or much better equipped to deal with these sorts of things, but followed less competent in this domain boss and superiors when they told them, don't follow up on those allegations. Um, and importantly, the coaches at USA Gymnastics, many of them had, were believed to have very special, almost unique talents. Um, uh, Bella and Martha Caroli are, I think, examples. My guess is many of you have heard of the Carolis. Um, that's a feature of gymnastics. Um, as Dr. Letourneau pointed out, I, I have done research and I'm still doing research on professional cycling. Um, if I told you, or I asked you who Lance Armstrong's coach was, my guess is no one would know. Um, it's a feature of gymnastics. And the other thing about USA Gymnastics, partly because there is no professional gymnastics league, and it's all about the Olympics, coaches had a tremendous amount of informal power over the top brass as well as the athletes because they were viewed as possessing what was necessary to give athletes the opportunity for success and to win medals. By the way, as you might guess, um, this was these sorts of kinds of power were, were operative at the Catholic Church. Um, certainly priests had a form of authority that allowed them much wider range of um, uh, activities over which they could gain control. And that's really tragically visible in the documentary, The Keepers, where the priest could simply tell an office staff, I want to see student X they would get student X. Um, also, the Catholic Church, again, very evident in the, in the documentary, The Keepers, had a tremendous amount of economic, political, and social power in the communities where they were situated. In Boston, in particular, owned a tremendous amount of land, um, influenced um, electoral politics by to a great extent influencing the political views of their parishioners, and had a tremendous amount of social power through the control of education, parochial schools, um, athletic leagues, and on and on. 
if I had time, I would talk about um, institutional logics, but I, again, I want to be, a, I want to play well with friends and, and <laughs> keep us roughly on schedule. Um, so I want to turn to the, the last thing I wanted to discuss, and that is often when I pr make presentations about the role of organization theory and misconduct in organizations, um, I hear a rebuttal, and that rebuttal is, Sure, these structures are present in organizations, and sure, they influence people. But if you're a good person, if you're a moral person, you will overcome them. And I have two responses to that. I, I want to appeal to you on the basis, first, on volumes of research that suggest that these structures even influence good and moral people. In particular, in circumstances where there is uncertainty. The most horrendous examples of abuse, there, there's no uncertainty about. I don't want to say all abuse is uncertain. But in many cases, to people who are witnessing the abuse, it's unclear exactly what they're seeing. And to many victims, it's unclear what they're experiencing. And that was, again, tragically brought home in um, the statements made at Dr. Larry Nasser's sentence hearing, where a number of gymnasts said, I didn't understand what was happening to me until I got to be 18 or 19 and 20. And then I realized what I had been experiencing was abuse. I knew it wasn't right. I knew it didn't feel good. I knew it was demeaning. It was invasive in all sorts of ways. But it didn't occur to me that that was something called sexual abuse. So um, what are the policy implications? Very briefly, I think there's some good news and some bad news. So the good news is we've got all these structures. They influence behavior in organizations. Lots of dials to turn and levers to pull. Um, plus, there's a literature in organization theory about how to use these things to change organizations. The bad news is that as important as one-size-fits-all guidelines and codes of conduct are, and they are exceptionally important. And it's one of the, the major contributions of the Royal Commission on, on um, Child Sexual Abuse. They're likely not going to be enough, because there are multiple dimensions of organizations which are operating on people. And we have to take into account how these structures and processes operate in particular organizations if we want to reform them to really comprehensively address the problem of child sexual abuse. Thanks very much. <laughs>